I'll keep it brief to the point. Ask your questions as they come. Do whatever you fancy. Um, don't be too polite. Um, so, Taste of India. Um, you might be thinking, well, what on earth possessed her to go to India? Um, apart from a natural curiosity um, and a love of going to different places, the most obvious thing is that I was asked to go, so that was great. And um, we've linked up with uh, a, an organisation called Excellence in India. And Excellence in India is a joint venture with um, invest, improving business performance, is it not, Nick? That's it. Nick sits on their board, so that's uh, amongst the, the various hats that he, uh, he wears. And they've got a joint venture with an Indian organisation who was so blown away by the concept of investors and people having experienced it here that they persuaded IBB to go into this joint venture organisation. And so Excellence in People now have the licence to offer investors in people in India. Huge potential there, really. And um, why I got involved is that I was talking to uh, IBP's um, chief exec, who sends his apologies. He was going to be coming today and unfortunately has some family issues. Um, I was talking to him because I've known him for, for many years and we were just um, exploring what, what had happened to Cullen Schofield. We'd been through investors since 1998, uh, kept on getting it. And then when the gold standard came out in 2010, we went for that. Um, for those of you who don't know much about investors in people gold, um, the, the, the actual standard has 39 indicators. To get to go gold status, you need to hit 165 indicators. Um, in 2010, we hit 178 indicators. Um, I think our assessor was a little bit uh, frazzled with me when we were planning the assessment. And I said, well, why don't you just assess us against the lot and I'll use it as a stock take. Um, and I thought that we'd probably go into a silver, but obviously I was delighted when we went into the gold. Um, so in 2013, we needed to get reaccredited again or reassessed. And in that time, the consultant team had remained stable, um, but the administration team had turned over totally, apart from one person. So I was fascinated to then see how well I'd managed, or we'd managed to get that new admin team into position and bre breathing and living what Cullen Schofield is about. Um, so we got reaccredited in 2013, and this time we hit a um, hundred and what is it? There are 198 indicators in all, and we're up to 192 now. So only six left, and some of those are unattainable because we're not unionised. So it's it, well, it could it's, be. It, <laughs> we could be. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting story about how you can use investors as a business tool because certainly when I was thinking about, oh God, reaccreditation is coming up, I didn't think about that at the beginning of 2013. Of course, you have to think about that probably 2011, which was our worst trading year ever. And so it's, it's been quite an interesting journey to not only bring on a new team, but also to, to live those deals in this economic climate that we're in. And I believe that Investors in People is the UK's single most important tool for businesses, but it's also its single most misunderstood and under-recognised tool. Um, I was at a presentation um, by the chief exec of um, Gatwick Airport. Nick kindly invited me. And because at Gatwick Airport, there's a big debate about second runway, all of that sort of thing. And in that meeting, he was telling us about all of the improvements that have happened at Gatwick Airport. And since I'm regularly in and out of Gatwick, I know those improvements. And I've seen the turmoil as well. Um, and he's saying that, you know, we're now going for accreditation. We're going for our ISOs and, of course, investors and people. And we're pleased to have it. And this has made a difference. And I'm just thinking... Golly gosh, here we've got a business leader actually attributing some of the innovation and the good ideas down to investors and people. So enough about investors and people, I'll get off my hobby horse, but you can see I'm quite passionate about it because I think it's a good discipline. 
So, what was the format? Well, it was a speaking slot at a day-long conference. Um, the major thing that I found quite interesting is that it was an, the, the audience was predominantly HR at the conference and predominantly women. I'll just throw that in for uh, insight. And then there was a speaking slot at a cocktail party um, and the key business leaders in Bangalore law or Bangalore were there uh, at the express invitation of the High Commissioner and that still carries weight. And it was rather interesting seeing UKTI's banners up there and Great Britain and you suddenly thought, oh, really, I live there. And, uh, but very interesting and, you know, shades of the Raj and again, that <coughs> audience was almost totally male. And I was doing as you do, standing in the front, waiting for people to assemble. And they were doing the usual thing, getting into little clusters and not moving, just as you did earlier on. And uh, I thought, if I was back home, would I be there? I'd be out there with the business cards, introducing myself and melling around. So, of course, I did that. Uh, India at the moment has adopted a part Japanese, part Indian way of dealing with business cards. So when I was in Japan some time ago, I was reading up about the cultural differences because I was working with a company who was very strong on making sure that I didn't uh, commit any cultural faux pas. So I was practicing. I, I got a new business card holder because, you know, that, that's the thing to do. And then I was practicing the solemn accepting of a business card with both hands, reading it and bowing the head a little bit, and then obviously offering your own. Well, what happened in India was that you had a mixture. You've, you've, you've got a handbag, you've got the business cards, you've got the two hands, and you're, then sometimes it's one hand, and then you've got to give your own business card. Well, the handbag got jettisoned very quickly because there was just no way it was going to work. But um, it was interesting to see that this uh, acknowledgement of business cards is still a tradition that we're, we're, we're following. And yet here, oh yeah, business card, boom, and away it goes. But none of this sort of momentary pause. So if you're ever travelling, do bear that one in mind. It's great fun. So the speak, I, I had two different presentations at uh, the, 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 the conference. One was much more HRE, but the, uh, the one in the evening, I was specifically asked to be a lot more hard-hitting about the business reasons for doing um, investors and what research uh, is available on that. Um, so, just impressions of Bangalore. I would say, fabulous place to start an Indian adventure. Uh, I was born and brought up in Africa, so the great divide of poverty and uh, money um, wasn't new to me. And I'd sort of, a few years ago, been to Sri Lanka, so I, I'd, I'd refreshed my, my memories of that. But um, the climate was fabulous. Saw some of the same flora and fauna that I grew up with, so it was, it was a lovely trip for me in that way. It's a highly technical uh, area, not just IT, but aerospace as well. Um, and um, the energy is amazing. I landed at the new airport, which is similar to Terminal 5 in its sophistication drove out of it, got metered, greeted, drove out of it, and for several miles we were on this beautiful highway. And then all of a sudden we were on bumpy roads. And what they're doing is they're building this huge concrete um, expressway into the center of Bangalore so that the speed of the transfer can be uh, much more effective. But uh, they're only three quarters of the way, so we ended up on uh, Indian roads. And... The service was absolutely amazing. I bumped into somebody at the CIPD conference last week from New Zealand. She said, I haven't been to the UK for a long time. She said, what's happened to your service? And I thought, oh, that's interesting. She said, it's an effort to get everything. Um, and while I'm on the service, um, Accident prone and Cullen Schofield sometimes goes hand in hand, and especially if my lovely Carol Bates is, is with me, you know, the potential for accidents um, increases. But, I mean, this is, this is where she can sort of definitely thumb her nose at me because I arrived 5.30 in the morning, a little bit sort of weary. My suitcase had got a lot of uh, marketing materials in it, so it was marked heavy load. 
got it off the trolley thing, got to the hotel and I thought, oh, they've locked it. I never normally lock my suitcases. And I thought, okay, well, okay. I talked to the receptionist. I said, well, somebody's going to have to perhaps come up and we'll have to break the locks to get it in. Got into the room and I'm not OCD, although anybody who doesn't polish in my granite at home is, is in trouble. And I, I thought this suitcase is looking a little bit dirtier than mine. And then when I examined it closely, of course, it wasn't my suitcase. And by this time, it's around about quarter to six, and uh, I rang to reception because the uh, handyman had turned up ready to do the business with the locks, and I thought, whoa, we better not. So he went and rang to the reception, and they said, don't worry, ma'am, we'll, 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 we'll help. And then within five, ten minutes, oh, I'm at the airport, remember I greeted you? Yes. Don't worry. He said, um, can you write me a letter saying that you authorise me to take your suitcase away? It, I gave him my uh, number from the baggage tag, and within 45 minutes, my suitcase was there. And would we have had that in the UK at that time of day? Just no way. Um, the flip side to that is, of course, coming back into Heathrow, I spotted my suitcase on the round, and I knew it was mine, and there was another man across the, the gangway looking at it intently. And I thought, this is the moment, you know, we're talking about truth and honesty. Do I go up to him and say, I'm awfully sorry, or do I just skulk? Hands up for skulking. <laughs> didn't dare because God knows what his experience was like but anyway, but I go back to that service um, yeah, service was amazing driving around, nerves of steel traffic coming at all angles love the um, moped rule where the driver of the moped or scooter wears a crash helmet passengers two, three, four don't and we questioned that and uh, I'm told that apparently the law says that one person must wear a crash helmet, and that was interesting. But again, uh, after the conference, we went to um, on a couple of sales visits. One was uh, with a mixture of a joint venture between Rolls Royce and an Indian company, and of course, Rolls Royce knew about investors and people, and the chief exec there knew about it, and. It was fascinating to get to this place, which was just a little bit outside Bangalore. The roads were interesting, shall we say. Potholes, cows in the road, and what have you, swerving around. And then as soon as we rocked up to near where this uh, factory was, absolute sp spotless tarmacadam road, security gates, and this factory had been built within 18 months and was operating 24-7. Um, and making parts for um, engines, you know, aeroplane engines. So uh, growing exponentially and uh, just a fascinating organisational uh, experience. So that's the feel of it. So the trends. It was really good because, you know, when you're at a conference, you not only have the joy of speaking, but you can also assimilate what is going on around you. And that, to me, is one of the really good things about going to conferences. And I was quite curious. Um, one of the reasons I agreed to go to India is that we have come across a number <clears throat> of Indian uh, women, I have to say, who have followed their husbands to the UK. They've had careers in HR in India and yet have not been able to work, although they're approved to work in this country, because people wouldn't recognize their HR experience. So I was thinking, and when I got to talk to them and found out what they've been doing, um, they've come on some of our programs and successfully have managed to transfer and get a CIPD qualification. So I was really interested to see what the, um, the buzz would be at this conference. So... Definitely business partner roles is on the increase. Um, definitely a one world, one HR feel. A lot of global companies there um, represented, bringing in there. Enhanced employee engagement was something that was coming out loud and clear, mainly because India is facing its own challenges in that area. And I'll come back to that later. The other thing was an increasing reliance on HR and technology. There is a sort of a very general feel that um, 
HR professionals aren't awfully IT literate um, and aren't awfully good at technology and the use of it and also the deployment of um, HR data and analytics. But certainly in India, those two topics were high in terms of things that were on the minds of the presenters. And interestingly, if I compare it back to uh, CIBD in Manchester last week, those topics were high, uh, again, on the technology and the data. Um, so, what was behind the sort of rise of the HR business partner? Again, similar pressures to us, uh, the pressure to um, add strategic value, and that's intensifying. Um, the need to abandon silo mentality in HR. So um, trying to get more cross-organisational. And the need to be more agile, responsive and cohesive. Um, and somebody used the phrase that HR must be in the skeleton of the business. And I quite like that because it's almost HR is the skeleton on which flesh is built. So some of those thoughts there. Um, again, if I compare and contrast to Manchester, very similar. Um, <coughs> and perhaps where we're going away from is this uh, slavish adoption of the Ulrich model. And, you know, people are actually saying, well, Ulrich himself said it, he never perceived it to be adopted in the way it has been adopted. <coughs> so, interesting moves. So this one world and one HR, um, all about sort of growing competitions, shrinking margins, uh, economy of scale, driving organisations to, um, to, 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 to improve. Um, a feeling, though, that whilst that's important, also local participation in decision-making was still very important. And as you would expect, higher need for flexibility mobility and cultural sensitivity. So again, if you're mi working in that mixed cultural environment to get that cultural sen sensitivity on the move. And collaborative working being the norm with a diverse team structure and diverse not only in terms of our traditional diversity thinking but also um, diverse in terms of functional makeup. Um, so teams formed for specific projects and then reshaping again for another project. Um, so lots of similarities, really. Um, now getting on to the employee engagement side, which is really interesting. Well, it challenges all organisations. Um, and whilst they were saying that they'd seen some improvements, um, what they were thinking about very much was to enable workers with um, the right set of tools, the resources and support and creating workplaces that are energising. So whilst some of the people who saw um, Goffey and Jones at uh, Manchester last week were saying, well, they, they were a bit lacklustre, still what they were saying and what we use in the, what I, I wrote in the blog on uh, last Thursday, that dreams mnemonic, is still there fighting us even in India and in the UK. This whole thing about making work an energising place to do business in. And you know, I, you can't argue it. If you think about the number of hours we spend working, if it ain't fun, what the hell are we doing it for? And if we can't, as I think we were having a conversation at lunchtime, if we can't see that connect to you're going to be able to prosper and grow and get filthy rich and what have you, well, why are you working? And you know, we've got nearly a million unemployed youngsters at the moment. If we come out, excite them about working, we're going to have a really lean time during our pensionable years, because who the hell's going to pay our pensions? Um, <clears throat> and this promotion of physical, emotional, social well-being, again, those are good employee engagement constructs that are around. Um, but again, what seems to be surprising, I find, is that something that is quite simple as a concept seems to be so difficult to actually get into managers' heads. And it's a, a, a real challenge. So, HR and technology. 
I'm often known as a gadget queen, so I, I love technology. But I'd really sincerely believe that HR is um, technology is HR's greatest ally. And again, they were talking very much about technology and the use of it and the deployment, and also the management of knowledge inside organisations. And I saw one interesting in, uh, side in terms of social enterprise systems. Schneider Electric, company of a 160 years old, global company, they're trying to do away with emails and move on to this um, social systems working. So the shared networks, getting the buzz going, getting knowledge going across, getting collaboration internally and externally across the business um, units. And the benefits being that really HR people can support their organization's participation in virtual environments. So we have clearer and more consistent messages going out. And this access to unexpected knowledge. I have to admit that I um, <laughs> fell asleep during a presentation of somebody, and I was sitting in the front row, so anybody sitting in the front row nods <laughs> off, you're perfectly okay, at the CIPD Centre Conference this summer. And uh, the woman's voice was very monotone. It was breakfast time, I think, and I, <laughs> I buzzed off. Um, but it, despite the topic being social media, um, she was saying that she had this fabulous gateway, while I was awake, um, this fabulous <laughs> gateway where people could access learning, could share knowledge. And actually what she was finding is that they weren't using it. What they were using was social media instead. And so she ended up closing down that gateway. So for those of us thinking about monolithic structures for learning, that's too outdated now. And we really need to think about a much more agile um, structure going forward. Because you will get unexpected stuff coming through. And I think, if I think about anything these days, it is challenging and seizing and making the most of the unexpected rather than going for the routine and the predictable. Because life is not expectable, it's not predictable anymore. Um, and improved corporate social responsibility and better stakeholder ownership and accountability. So again, this is, in a way, some of the themes that were coming out of Manchester last week was this need for transparency, this need for honesty and openness. If you adopt this sort of space, it's going to be open. Um, so quite scary in many ways. And this is a sort of diagram of where Schneider Electric are going, and they call it their SPICE program. Don't, for God's sake, ask me what SPICE means. I did have it written down, but it's gone. It's problems of old age. It comes in one window and out the other. Um, but they're basing it on a, a sort of TIBA uh, platform, and they're trying to get all of these systems working together so there is one integrated system that people will do. I, I'd, I'd be fascinated to see how it goes for them and whether it's just an IT dream or a nightmare. I have huge cynicism about IT systems. Richard, I don't know with your uh, IT background what you think on that. It's an awful lot of technology out there. They're one hell of a lot of bloody technology and it's global and it's up in the cloud. So, you know, and the security side of stuff up in the cloud has still not been absolutely verified. So, you know, if you'd ask a cloud provider to absolutely guarantee that your data is unhackable, they won't sign the dotted line. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a movement in the field of bamboo or something. It's a ripple. It's coming through. Something along this line will come through. Um, I think, you know, it's lovely that Wilson's got this glitzy job title of insights. Well, this is an insight. It, you know, it's, it's no more, it's no less. But if it sparks some other thoughts, that's of value. So, we go back to our lovely friend of data and analytics. And, you know, I think it's, it's quite blunt here. You know, just as the finance functions are going to be able to talk about revenue, expenses, profit, and shareholder value. 
and marketing people are talking about customers and cash flow impact. Similarly, HR needs its own set of metrics, and I'm really pleased to see that there are moves afoot to getting that more. So that again was announced at the um, at CIPD's uh, conference. But you know, this whole concept of people in HR not being able to tell them, tell us how a business is measured by its success and by its people is just nightmarish. I happen to have sort of grown up in the, in the hospitality and catering world and you know it was very common there for people to be able to tell you, managers to be able to tell you what their bed night uh, uh, occupancy was, what their uh, room rates were, average room rates, how much it cost to clean a room you know, what their staff turnover was. Now, why is it that we seem to have lost some of those basics? And it wasn't clustered, you know, sheltered knowledge that nobody knew about. It was regularly talked about. You remember, we had a contract with 20 hotels, and, you know, the rankings were published every week. And it was name and shame. Oh, well, you're at the top of the list or the bottom of the list this week for this, that, or the other. So why is HR shying away from having these quantifiable measures? Um, I think we do ourselves a huge disservice, and then we end up as just being the scoopers up of all the rubbish that managers don't actually want to deal with. And we have got to actually get our case together. But it's interesting that the same issues are coming out in India as, as here. Um, so, reflections. Um, that fabulous can-do attitude pervades everything. Sophistication. I think if we actually say, oh, India, it's a developing world or whatever, I think that is a huge arrogance on our part. The sophistication that's there is incredible. Uh, cultural divides, which I've touched on. And this fourth bullet po point, I think, is really going to be interesting, and I will be watching that space with eagerness, because the, they've got their own I generation now. And it is beginning to vex them in terms of young people in India are very much interested in the salaries, the career expectations, and they're challenging the management style. So sometimes the management style in India is very dictatorial. You do as I tell you to do because I have the power, I have the status, and the young people are actually not accepting that anymore. And that challenge is going to be really quite interesting to see how that melds out. And the family life scenario where everybody was living together is breaking up. I mean, it's amazing. In Bengaluru itself, the amount of desres, flats and uh, apartment blocks and things like that that are growing up. And that's going to divide the cultural strength that India has had in the past where the family was together. And how that will mesh out. Will they become more as spoilt and as pampered as our own youngsters? If you take that point. If they are. It's going to be an interesting one. And how India then copes with that. Um, as people get more and more educated and advanced. Um, they're going to have the same challenges that we, we're now facing. So the engagement issue is going to be critical for them. How do they get people involved and committed? And that, in turn, is going to have an effect on their management. And if their management is of the older school, that clash is going to get interesting as well to see. So, sharp and to the point. <laughs>